Do you want to break into the comic book industry as a writer? In this video, I interview a successful TV and comics writer named Pornsack Pichichot, who not only got his start as an editor at DC Comics' Vertigo imprint, but also has a new Image Comics miniseries coming out called The Good Asian. It's a film noir style detective story set in 1936 Chinatown. And you can pre-order it from your local comic book store right now. If you would like to learn more, then you can find the link in the description below. Without further ado, here is my interview with Pornsack Pichichote. How did you break into comics? How you got your start? I'm sure the people at home watching this right now would 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 love to know your story and and how that's transitioned over time. I mean, I have an ass backwards way into comics, so um, so I kind of feel like my story helps no one, but 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 for anyone interested, <laughs> is um, I mean, I've been in, into comics ever since I was a kid, and for a while I thought. You know, I start off as a short story writer or doing screenplays for a while. And for a while, I thought I was going to keep comics that one thing I did for fun. And then what happened was I hit this point in my life where I decided I was doing like part time work. And I was like, you know, I just got to freelance. I just have to like live the life of a freelancer and just kind of go for it. And uh, and so I'm not going to take any full time jobs. I'm not going to take any, you know, temp work, which is what I was doing to like pay the bills and all that kind of stuff. So I went to college for writing. Okay. I mean, I, I, I did a weird thing where I did a computer science and an English double major because there was no way I could convince my parents that I was just going to college just for writing. So I needed to have to do something practical as well. But then eventually, you know, and then for a while after that, I got a job in programming. And this was like during the like the big tech bubble. And I hated it. And I decided to um, I decided to, you know, quit that job and just focus my time on my writing and do like little part-time job on the side and like little temp jobs on the side. And, and that actually doing that actually was really, I never really thought about it, but it, 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 it was really helpful in later parts of my career because I quit the tech bubble right when it was booming. So, so it was doing very well. And I kind of walked away to sort of focus on writing. And, um, and so that was a couple of years of a couple of years of a, uh, of you know me writing on the working my writing on the side, taking a part time job. I worked on a comic book a part time at a comic book store for a little bit. I would do temp work, you know, where you're you know I was in an office for three months of the year and all that. And then I was doing like film work on the side, and you know f indie film work pays not very well at all. And so I would just kind of balance all those all those things with my writing. And and then I finally decided like you know if I'm going to go for it, let's go for it. Let's not. I'm not going to take any temp work. I'm not going to forget the part I'm going to try to just live at my life as a freelancer um I did that for like two months and then a friend of mine emailed me out of the blue and was just like hey Karen Berger at Vertigo is looking for an assistant editor I don't know what any of those words mean but I feel like you do and it feels like you'd be good for it and you know I was a big Vertigo fan I was a big fan of Karen's in particular and so it's like yeah I would love to do that but like I'm not looking for a full-time I just told myself I am gonna freelance I'm not gonna you know do any of this stuff but uh, but I really want to meet Karen Berger so I took the job interview with just the interest of meeting Karen Berger we hit it off really well she invited me back to do an editing test I took the editing test that went well enough that she invited me back for a second interview second interview she offered me the job and this whole time I'm thinking like I don't know if I want a full-time job like I told myself I want to be a freelancer but finally by the time the full the offer for the full-time job came it's like you know what I've taken these six months like temp jobs before and managed to keep writing and managed to keep working in film. Think of this as like a one year temp job. I could temp work the job for a year. I could, you know, and Karen was editing all my favorite comic writers. She was editing Grant Morrison, Peter Milligan, and like, you know, and it was Vertigo. All my favorite books were coming out of Vertigo. So I just thought like I would learn so much about writing from that side of the desk. I'd be stupid not to take it for at least a year. So I took that job. And comics treated me really well. I ended up, I was at Vertigo for about seven years. I went from assistant editor to full editor. And there, I, I want, there is a world where I never would have left editing comics. I loved it so much. Uh, but what happened was that around that time, Warner Brothers kind of restructured DC. And so, um, and so they wanted to make more of its film, of its properties and bring them over to film and TV. And so, there was a lot of rumors at the time that DC was going to move out to LA. 
And I was like, I don't want to move out to LA. That sounds like the worst thing in the world. And that's when I thought like, okay, I think it's time for me to think about leaving comics and go back to like writing. And, you know, and the, I was working on an outline for something that would eventually become Infidel at the time, which I had thought about shooting it as like a $2 million, like indie horror movie sort of in New York. And, um, and, but then what happened was I was at San Diego Comic-Con. I think I was hanging out with Peter Gross at, 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 the, at the convention, at, at the table at his signing. And Jeff Johns comes up to me and he's just kind of like, hey, and Jeff, Jeff at the time had just turned, been promoted to chief creative or just hired as chief creative officer for DC. And Jeff was like, you know, it's so crazy. We've been working at DC for the, the, the same amount of time but we've never like hung out, like we should hang out. And I was like, okay, you run the company now. I'm not gonna say no to this. So I said, yes. And then he walks away and I turned to pretty gross, like, I don't know what just happened. I think Jeff Johns just asked me on a date. I don't really understand what just happened. But, you know, I go out and hang out with Jeff Johns. We have a ton of fun. And, and then I think at the time, like maybe he wants me to edit his new Vertigo book. I, I don't really know, uh, but we had ha lots of fun. Nothing comes from it. So I'm like, oh, well, at least I got to have fun hanging out with Jeff Johns. And then I actually don't know how much time, maybe a month or two later, uh, Jeff would take me aside and was like, listen, I'm starting this think tank up in LA to turn other, to turn comics into other media, uh, to, to turn comics into other media. I'd love for you to be a part of it you know, with everything you know about Vertigo, I really want a Vertigo guy in there. And, um, and, and it was one of those things where, you know, I, I didn't know if I, I didn't want to move to LA. At the same time, it felt like one of those things that like, if I didn't do it, I'd regret it for the rest of my life. So I decided, you know what, you know, I'll, I'll go. And kind of the same um, mentality is when I started Vertigo in some ways, which I don't think I ever really realized until talking about it on this interview is just that like, I was like, you know what, give it a year. And if it doesn't work for a year, I'll just come back to New York and I'll figure out what the next part of my life is and all that kind of stuff. And then I ended up staying there for four years, four and a half years. And, uh, and, and eventually I decided, you know, it's, I think it's time for me to write my own stories. Uh, you know, I'd taken, you know, what was like at that point, like an 11 year digression away from writing my own stuff. But like, I just loved every second of it, you know, but it was just time to get back to writing my own stuff. And then, you know, and then became this thing of like, well, you know, I want to write TV. I want to write comics. Let's give that a shot. A lot of nothing proceeded to happen for like two years, two, maybe three years. I can't actually remember. And then, uh, and what happened was things just happened happened at the same time so you know I put out Infidel the same time I got my first TV writing job and then it was it's ever since then it's just been balancing both but um but yeah but that's kind of how I it's a very long circuitous way into comics and uh and and yeah and, and the only thing I can the only thing uh advice I can give coming because my story is so unique and it's so it's it's so like me like I don't know if I want to do this and then ended, ending up doing this um was that things that things that helped me was just set, just like shooting higher for shooting high and then being able to settle for something sort of along the way but never you know I wasn't one of those guys of just like I want to get in the mail room and I want to do this and this like, like I wanted to write and people you know there's is a little something about sort of respecting your time, your own time, you know, that's something that uh, both Karen and Jeff were just like, listen, I know you could be doing other things. I know you want to do other things. So while you're here, I just really want to make it worth your while and really want to make sure you get something out of it. And, um, and that, you know, I really appreciate it. It's great to have great bosses who think that way. But I think also like the energy you bring into the room of just like, no, you know, just, just knowing the value of your time, knowing what you want to do. I mean, that sort of really helped me through, through, through that, through all those, that time. Huh. That's, that's interesting. I, I would love to learn more about like um, the transition, just in a craft mentality, just in a yeah. job mentality from um, from going from comics to uh, uh, to TV. But I'm curious, uh, I'm curious about that editing. What was that editing test that Karen gave you when you were just starting out? Okay, so here's the funny thing about the editing test. I swear to God, they only gave it for like a year, and I because like I don't know anybody else who took this editing test. Like it was the like. Um, I, or maybe one other person, I can't, I, I can't remember. Or, or maybe I was the only person who took this editing test. I actually don't know. They gave me an issue, an uncorrected proof of an issue of Hellblazer. I want to say it was issue like 187, 188, something like that. Um, I still remember because, um, oh shoot, now 
Doug, El no, I forget his name. Um, I used to know the name of the artist who did, because I, because he's a great artist, but, and it's like one of the few issues of Hellblazer Pleasures he's done. Um, but there were a couple errors. So I would just mark up what the errors were. And then I had to write up solicitation copy for that issue of Hellblazer. And that was, and that was, and I had like, I don't know, half hour, an hour to do it, something like that. Okay. But yeah, but that's what the test was. I'm and they, they brought me to like an, an office in like Warner Brothers in New York and just like sat me in this room and just gave, it was, it was, but I don't like it. I don't think anyone else has done it since then. Wow. And, and for, uh, you know, for the guys at home who are watching this or girls at home who are watching this, um, what's the difference between a assistant editor, what they do uh, and what a full editor does? You know, it's interesting. And one of the only thing I can sort of say is that it, every editor works differently. And so every editor's relationship with their assistant editor is different. So, um, so I only really know how it worked at Vertigo. And so um, at Vertigo, and it's a thing that I kind of loved was that as an assistant editor, you basically do everything an editor does. I used to say the difference between being an associate editor, editor and an editor was just, I got two hours less sleep a night when I was an editor. And what that means for me is that as an assistant editor, my job, I read all the scripts, I do all the art. I might not be talking to talent as much as an editor is, although sometimes some editors are busy and have their assistants talk to editors as well, depending on the relationship. But you're really doing everything an editor's doing. But what you're doing is you're offering your boss, the editor options. It's like, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. Like, you'll see a problem. Like, I would read all of Karen's scripts and she, you know, she would want to see my notes. And I'd be like, well, this, you know, I think this is, I think this is a problem. Like, that's a problem. But it's her job at the end of the idea to say, yes, that's a problem. No, that's not. Yes, that's not. Yeah, we'll do this. Yeah, we'll do that. And she has to make all, or she made, the editor makes all the choices. As an assistant, all you have to do is give options. And so that's what I mean. Where it's like, it's all the same work, but the real stress of being an editor comes in is it's like, all right, there are 18,000 ways to make something better. What is the actual correct way? And an editor's job is to pick out all those correct ways. So that's the real difference. The actual work is the same. The stress as an editor is a lot more because you know, you're now taking responsibility for the mistakes. That's interesting. You know, I guess, I guess we should take a step back. Like, I guess um, people don't know the benefit of, of an editor or what an editor does. You know, I, I hear, I see, you know, um, advertisements for you should get, uh, even for indie work, doing it all by yourself, you should still get an editor. You know, what do editors do? What are the benefits of editors? Um, and, and, and the relationship between an editor and the writer, uh, I'm, you know, if you could explain that, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I mean, so I worked at Vertigo and which I still consider some of the best editors working in comics. And so, and I will say too, that I think different editors, uh, you know, it's one of the great things about comics is that different editors define that job differently and different editors do different things. And um, Vertigo, we really tried to be a one shop fits all. And so, you know, we were your ally, we were your production coordinator, we were your therapist, we were like kind of all of those sort of things. So like a good editor, you know, if you're a writer, a good editor reads your pitch and tells you how to make it better. A, a good editor reads your scripts and helps you with the problems in your scripts. A good editor, any uh, political backlash your book is facing within the company, a good editor deals with it without letting you know about it. Um, a, you know, a good editor helps you find artists. A good editor helps you um, if there are problems between the different artists, between the, the, the artists and the colorist and the letterer, a good editor takes care of that without you having to worry about it. A good editor handles all this, handles the production schedule. Um, it follows up with the artists to make sure that they're on time. And so everyone down in the book get, gets their piece of it at the right time so no one's lacking work and no one has to take work, take up work somewhere else and therefore puts a book behind schedule. A uh, good editor does that without you knowing about it. Um, uh, a good editor, you know, might bring an artist on board but that artist might not have a colorist in mind. So a good editor will figure out what the right colorist 
does, you know, uh, in term, and that's just on the, for how an editor helps a writer, in terms of how an editor helps an artist, a good editor will look at layouts and say, oh, the storytelling isn't completely clear. Can you change this? A good editor will look at when it goes to pencils, it said like, oh, this feels a little weird. Can you fix it in the inks? A good editor when it looks at the inks says like, oh, well, like this, it looks a little wonky. So can you fix, fix that? A good editor will help it with cover design, might throw ideas to uncover artists. Like, have you thought about this for a cover? And then when you'll get those design sketches back, they'll come, they'll, they'll say like, ooh, I don't know, like maybe if you did this or like, this is awesome, you push this or just go kind of thing. And all the time. So a, a good editor really is trying to be invisible, but um, being a, it's at the end of the day, you're being a friend to your creative team and you're, you're helping your creative team look at their absolute best. And, and it's one of the reasons why like at, at Vertigo, that was a lot easier to do in some sense, or it's a lot more straightforward in some sense and work in Marvel and DC because in Marvel and DC, an editor is also a franchise manager. Batman wouldn't do this. The Atom looks like that. Superman's costume is different now. So they've got all those sort of things. But as an editor, when you're working on original material, you're really there to service the material and the creators. And so a lot of times when I was an editor, you know, I we, we I talk about story with my with my talent, and they'll be like, I want to do this, 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 and this. And I'll get a script back, and I'll be and I'll come back and I'll say, guys, this is awesome. Um, I remember though that you said you want to do these two things. And that was really cool. This script isn't doing that. Um, and I just want to check that that's still something you're interested in in the script. And almost all the time, those writers be like, oh, no, 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 I still want to do that. And it's like, okay, so let's talk about how we can have this script do that thing that you talked about originally a little bit more. And that becomes, but that hopefully is always the, when it's working, that's always the, the uh, mentality, the, the, the dynamic you want, where it's, the creative team has this idealized version of what the thing should look like. And an editor is doing everything they can at every step of the way to help them get to that idealized version of, of, of what they're trying to get. I, I, I hope that's not too abstract. That was a fantastic answer. I think that, um, you know, on, on, what you sounded like moments ago is the, you explained that the editor is the friend of the artistic team, yeah. but in the writing team, um, but I, you often hear the bad you often hear about the adversarial relationships. Case in point, you know, Todd McFarlane, you know, the spaghetti webbing uh, conflict with him and his editor and stuff like that. So, um, and I remember hearing you say in another interview I, I, I watched, um, it, you you make it a point to, to, to tell your editors uh, or to tell your teammates, you know, my job is to help you and, and not to hinder you. Or, you know, some people think like the some writers think like the, the editor wants to be the writer and he's trying to, you know, horn in on my act, uh, you know, and, and and I guess, you know, for, because you were at Vertigo. And that was one sort of dynamic versus like, uh, you know, the the brand manager, like, you know, Superman's cape wouldn't look, you know, Superman's outfit wouldn't look like that. You know, how would I guess my question is like, how, you know, how do you, uh, how do you, ma you know, wh how do you manage that? You know, how do you set artists at ease about that sort of thing? I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky because like, and again, like in, in my career, I didn't have to do, uh, since I was a vertigo editor, I didn't have to deal with a lot of that sort of stuff. Now, when I became a television exec, there was a little bit more of like, well, and when I was a TV exec, it was more sort of like, what is the, you know, what is the essence sort of of the character so it's like you know you know amanda waller wouldn't kill a city full of people unless it was for the greater good you know and like and like it's so it's understanding what the essence of the characters are i it it's a challenge and and it's it's something like i don't have personal experience to in terms of like i don't know what it's like to i've only edited like one dc title and, and that was like a single issue um and it was like Paul Levitz was writing it. So like he can kind of do whatever he wants. So, um, so, so I, I, I don't, I, I, I can't, you know, speak for, for other Marvel and DC editors where a lot of times too, they're a lot, they're micromanaged from the top of like these things have to happen. And that's where I think that's one of the, you hear so many stories I feel like about um, antagonistic relationships between editors and talent because it, because so much of comics and certainly at the moment is uh, is at Marvel and DC where editor's job is also sort of to protect the the franchise and to protect the brand and to, to, to protect the IP. And so you have creators who sort of want to go there. The, the thing that I've always found 
easiest, and I would hope that it's the same uh, at, Mar at Marvel and DC, is that if, you're if everyone's really clear what their intent is, it it's all, it's a, the fish stinks from the head. And so if you can establish, if everyone's on the same page creatively from the beginning, it's a lot easier than when you, because sometimes I've seen this too, where no one wants to disappoint anybody. So they keep everything like loosey goosey in the beginning with this idea like, oh, we'll tighten things up as we go. And that rarely works out, I feel like, because, you know, it's a lot easier, I find, if everyone agrees like this is what the things are. And then that way you can kind of always say, you know, hey, you know, you remember you want to do a Batman story about this? Well, we're not really doing that. You're not really doing that story. Or like, that's not what you promised me. And this is what kind of what we agreed on. So when you have that kind of original agreement, whether it be in writing or whether it be verbally to go back to, I think it, help, it makes it a lot easier. I think a lot of times, like, you know, in this world, and again, I can't speak to it personally, but I, it does sort of seem like the, the problems are you've got a world that's interconnected, that's got IP that needs to be protected, you make promises to certain creative teams and might maybe come out of other creative teams. And that's where a lot of that an antagonism can that start. I, yeah, I mean, I've done work for Marvel and DC, but because of my schedule, I can never do more than short stories. And for short stories, there's very little. There, you know, there, I, I, I get a lot of freedom. I actually get surprising amount of freedom for, for short I, I always expect them to tell me no. And they are like, yeah, sure, just go do it. And I think a lot of it is because like, yeah, it's an eight page short, short story, nobody cares. That's funny. Um, so that's that's interesting. Thank you for explaining that. I'm sure you, I think you pretty much demystified like exactly what we see uh, in the news on a regular basis. So 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 thank you for that. I'm sure there's people out there really appreciate that answer. Um, now, I'm curious, like so writing for comics I, and I don't know what kind of writing you were doing before comics. Um, but I know like writing for comics is one format. Writing for TV is another. I know it's a lot like um, a movie, you know, movie script, you know, final draft or whatever you use. Um, so, and then I know on top of that, you know, writing a 120 page movie script is going to be different than writing, uh, episodic TV. So I'm curious, uh, about what that's like. Cause I know there's some writers who say comic books is all I want to do. And there's other writers who say, no, I want to do movies. I want to write novels. Um, but you've you've directly gone from made the jump from not from from comics to TV, and so just for people trying to learn about that, you know, could you uh, could you tell us what that what that's like? Well, it's weird because like I I made the jump to comics and TV kind of simultaneously in terms of writing. So like again, I I don't know how much of my experience is is analogous sort of to other to other people. Um, what I can say in terms of of the differences between writing or how to, how I think about writing is that um, writing comics and television is that, and this is something I picked up when I was at DC uh, working on the media side is that, you know, comics, TV and movies, especially like big budget sort of movies. And I think it's more big budget movies I'm talking about now because I was working at Warner brothers and all that, like uh, there's a way there, you can certainly look at them and say, oh, they're all cars and they'll all take you eventually to sort of the same same place you know some might be a little bigger than others but they're all cars but the thing about it is if you pop up in the hood the wiring under the hood is all completely different and so different each medium requires a different thing to run in a certain just to get to the basic place so in my perspective of it comics runs on concepts on conceptual thinking it's one of the reasons why someone like alan moore and neil gaiman and grant morrison are some of the the you know, in mainstream comics are some of the biggest people because like you can do 3000 ideas in a comic book, you know? And part of the reason you can do 3000 ideas in a comic book is that a comic book is something, again, with just the three media I'm talking about, a reader controls time in a comic. So if Grant Morrison, which he does in a single balloon, gives a concept that like, I can make a whole comic book out of that one sentence that he just wrote. But what happens in your head is you stop and you think about the potential comics you could, you could make uh, with that one balloon. But if that same balloon becomes a line of dialogue in a film or a TV show, the time that you spend thinking about that is time the story has now progressed. And so that's one of the reasons why comics, and I think it's one of the reasons why Hollywood has like looked at comics, there's more ideas in comics than there are in a 
in a movie or a television show because comics can hold more ideas. It, it, it's a denser medium. In 22 pages of comics, there's more ideas than 30 minutes of any movie or any television show. And it's because of the nature of the medium because a reader can, can control time. A re can, reader can stop, just like in a novel, a reader can stop and think about all the ideas that come through. And because of that, we've come to accept, in my opinion, we've come to accept that more in comics. You know, we accept there being a little bit more ideas in comics. And if you read a 30 page comics, like this is kind of, I've seen all this already. Like you, you're more critical of that than a television show where you, it's like, ah, I've seen all this already, but something about that television show can kind of be comfort food. Not that co comics can't. Um, but for me anyway, comics is about conceptual thinking it, it, or it runs on conceptual thinking, um, which is to say that if there is no emotion in your comic, if there's no spectacle in your comic, there are some comics that actually manage to get by just concept, 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 the end. They're not great comics, but you can actually find like a decent comic that is enjoyable with just sort of that. You know, television runs on emotion. Television is about emotional moments and uh, between characters. And again, not great television, but but you can, there are perfectly fine episodes of television where it's just emotional beat, emotional beat, emotional beat, emotional beat, emotional beat, the end. Nothing new, no big ideas, but you're fine watching it. Movies, spec, movies for me, is, and again, I was working at Warner Brothers with DC, it's about spectacle. It's spectacle, 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 the end. And again, not a great movie, but you can watch a movie that's just huge amounts of spectacles and that's it. So to me, those are like the three, that's, these are what the, the, the things run on, the, the three different mediums run on. And then once you have that, like, okay, I don't want my comics to not be emotional. So what does that mean? You know, I think what happens with a lot of TV writers that, um, that come to comics is that they're so used to actors delivering uh, something where they'll do a panel and that panel is meant to be emotional. The problem is in, co in a television show or in a movie, you've got an actor be able to take that small moment and make it a bigger moment. In comics, you don't really have that. Comics is kind of a cold medium when you look at it that way. Like Alan Moore, there's a, Alan Moore, there's, and he's one of my favorite writers. There's so many scripts of his that I love. From Hell, I love. It's a cold book. There's a lot of cold passages, but there's so many ideas. There's so much critical thinking. You know, Watchmen, certain parts of it are very cold, but there's so much critical thinking. There's so much conceptual thinking. You don't mind it, right? Um, so, so the thing about comics then is if you want comics to be emotional, you almost have to construct a scene around the emotion. You have to construct a page around, okay, this is the emotion I want this page to convey. In the same way that if you're writing for TV or film, if you want to introduce a concept in TV or film, you have to construct a whole scene to introduce that concept. It isn't like comics where you can introduce a concept in a balloon. A reader will be like, oh, that's cool. Think about it for a while. It's like, all right, cool. And then go on with the, go on with the story. If a TV and a film, you have, almost have to set a scene up to construct all that. You've got to step the reader through the concept because they're going to progress. They're processing that information at the same time the story is moving. Um, but in comics, it's the same. So it's easier for comics, in my opinion, to convey co conceptual thinking than it is in film or TV. But that reverse work happens when it comes to emotion. For emotion, we have to construct a page. We have to construct a scene around conveying it emotionally. And as opposed to just tossing them off, which you can do in film and television, but you can't really do that in comics. You've got to, you know, it's about, you know, if you look at a book like if you look like a book like Blankets, which, you know, and I think, and, I, and I've told Craig this, Craig, Blankets is by Craig Thompson. And Craig has kind of described it as the longest book he could write about absolutely nothing because he wanted to just be purely about emotion. But the thing that kind of I found revelatory about, about Blankets, and I think he might be the first person I saw do this, was he was looking at the page as a unit. And he was looking at the page on how he could express emotion through a page information and emotion through a page at a time as opposed to as a panel at a time so and that was really effective and i've seen and i feel like that mentality has kind as more indie cartoonists have had, you know come to comics 10 15 years ago you saw more of that coming to comics of just let's look at the the page as a unit and so we're going to use this entire page to convey 
a character's loneliness or a character's joy as opposed to a panel. And it, and it just became, and that way of thinking became that much more effective at communicating emotion in comics. Again, this is my perspective on comics and its sort of progression in history. No, I think that's a that's a really cool perspective. I, I think you're right. Um, movies, TVs, comics all have their strengths, and a writer should be wise enough to say, "Hey, you know, you know, comic writer has to know you got to write for the page turn. It's just how it works." So, I can definitely appreciate that. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, as far as your 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 freelance your career now, it's pretty much free, freelance writing, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm curious how how Infidel came out. And uh, came about, uh, and how uh, the Good Asian is now coming about. Uh, would you be able to tell us uh, about those two projects? So, uh, Infidel was, you know, I it, w- it was funny. I really wanted to do a comic book. I, you know, after leaving after leaving DC, I knew I wanted to do a comic, and um, I. I had an idea for a comic and, you know, especially when you're starting off as a writer, sometimes you're just, you know, you're, you're just a hole pops up and you're just filling the hole as quickly as possible, uh, you know, and so I needed to write like a pilot script. I took an idea for a comic and wrote it as a pilot script because my agent, my reps needed something, but I still really wanted to write a comic. And, um, and then, and, and around the same time, I had this idea, this movie idea uh, that I had, you know, back when I was in New York, when I wanted to quit, I was thinking about quitting DC the first time. Um, and I, um, and I went to like a friend of a friend who was like a line producer and being like, I don't know anything. Cause like the movie was, but I had budgeted the movie. I was make that movie. like, it'd be $2 million. I don't know anything about like making a $2 million. I don't, that's a lot of money. So my friend of mine was just kind of like, oh, well, you know, if you make like a, you can make a lookbook and you know, that's, and you know, a lot of artists and you know, you know, a lot of artists. So like, if you make a lookbook, uh, that, that with all this and you can show it and you can find some investors. And I thought about it, oh, that's just like making a comic. And then I just thought like, it's just like making a comic. Why don't I just make a comic? And, you know, and it was one of those, and again, this is just how rigid some of my thinking can be. I thought about it as a screenplay for so long that um, the idea of turning it into a comic, well, it didn't work as a comic because like it was a horror movie and like the scares would have to be completely different. Plus coming from Vertigo, while I was at Vertigo, we had a lot of people coming from the film industry being like, Here's a screenplay that I could never get made. Let's make it into a comic. And they were never really good. So I've always tainted. For me, I never wanted a comic to be an adaptation of a screenplay or an adaptation of something that was going to be a movie. But I never wanted to do that. And so, but but something kind of clicked in me where it was just kind of like, oh, I it wouldn't work as a comic, which means I would have to completely rewrite it as a comic. And, I, and that actually was exciting for me. It's like, oh, I get to completely rewrite this. I get to do everything that comics can do. And then I also, to make it comics, I also had to kind of be like, oh, how do scares work in comics? How do, like, I had to really analyze and read a bunch of horror comics, which I was already reading, but reread them. I'll be like, okay, what is horror in comics as opposed to horror in other media? And that was fun. And that made like, okay, this is a comic book now. And so, and, but, Infidel was about xenophobia. It was about people from a lot of different racial perspectives. So I needed a, uh, you know, I couldn't just find a team that didn't know what they do. I needed a team of professionals. So they cost money. And everyone working for me at the time and still, I don't pay them nearly as much as, <laughs> as they're worth. Um, but it was still a lot for, for me at the time. So for me, a lot of it was, um, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I've talked to a lot of other writers and a lot of them was like, I have 15 ideas and I'm just pitching. I have this one idea that I really want to do as a comic because, you know, because it was about xenophobia, I realized I would just regret with the way the world was progressing. I would regret having the story sitting in a drawer somewhere and not being told because it seemed very relevant to what was going on. So I was going to pour everything I had to making it the best book that I can. And I honestly didn't believe I would be making any other comics other than that. I, you know, there's a mentality for me that I had at the time where it's just like, well, here's my budget. This is all the money I can pour into this. And then I'm going to have no much more money. So I'm going to move on and do the other thing because making comics this way is very expensive and I can't afford it. And, and it wasn't until very late in the thing where it's like, oh, wait a minute. I mean, I might not make a ton of money doing this, but I'll sell at least, I'll sell, sell some copies. I'll pro- I might sell half of the copies of the book. And if I do that, I could probably afford to do another comic. And I just, I, honestly, when I started making it, I, I honestly thought I just wouldn't have the money to do any other comics. 
And so, and Infidel came out and it ended up doing well and it made back all its money. It made more of its money and, you know, movie options started happening and all that sort of stuff. And, and so then it was just kind of like, oh, now people want me to make other comics. Um, and so what I thought was gonna be this one-time thing. And that's where the, and the idea for the good Asian I had had for a while, but the problem was, is like, you know, at the time, the only form I had was like, I guess I'll do a pilot script and talk about it, but it was a very bad pilot script because, and again, it was a very different project then because I was trying to cram all these ideas into like one like episode. And, and that's the other thing that Infidel really made me appreciate. It's like, oh, I got to tell a whole story and I get to tell a whole story and an audience gets to appreciate it and they get to tell me what's working and what's not and, and all that sort of stuff. And so then I saw like, oh, with the good Asian, I can tell this whole story and I can and give it to it and give it to an audience. And because for me and the good Asian is, you know, I call it Chinatown or we've started calling it Chinatown Noir. And it's about the 1936 detective story uh, featuring the first generation of Americans that grew up in, underneath an immigration ban, uh, the Chinese. And, and it was a, it came about because I had read about the Chinese Exclusion Act very late in life. And I, and I discovered that, I discovered the Immigration Act of 1924 that banned Asians and Arabs from coming into the country until it was, until it was amended. It was amended first in 1957 and then rescinded in 1965. And so the idea that America had this enormous history, this very long history where it, at some point it prohibited Asians from entering the country and Arabs from entering the country. At other portions, it, it, it curtailed their entry into the country. And that me as an adult Asian man, I didn't know anything about that. Uh, that made me want to tell a story about it. And then at the same time, and the thing I found interesting was I was always interested in, you know, growing up in the 1930s, there was a boom, uh, like Asian crime solvers were kind of a hit, like Charlie Chan, Mr. Moto, Mr. Wong. And the thing I find interesting now is that Charlie Chan, especially like he had 50 movies and he had movies around the world and there was there, he had a cartoon series and all that, but he's mostly been forgotten now. Uh, and he's mostly been forgotten because at the time he had all these movies and there was like a white guy, like dressed to make himself look Chinese and playing him. And so that's one of the reasons why no one talks about these movies anymore. But he was a very uh, famous sort of character and he stemmed in the 1930s. And I thought it was interesting. It's like for a while, America, the world was all about these Asian crime solvers working in America at a time where many of them couldn't enter the country. And so it would be interesting. I found it interesting of taking America's sort of racial history with Asians and then marrying it alongside this Asian crime solver genre, prototype and saying, okay, well, what, what would that really look like if you, if you took all of that, if you took all of that as it, as it really was. And that's kind of where the good Asian kind of came from. And it's become, you know, this, this book that I, you know, that obviously means a lot to me and obviously has gotten to me more to me as sort of like, you know, we're having this rash of anti-Asian hate crimes happening all around America. And so it's, you know, and it's part of, it, I think having people, you know, when you make a book, every, you want the readers to, you want everyone to sort of read it anyway, but certainly with everything that's happening in the world, the idea that, you know, ha there's a little bit more of incentive to have something read. If there wasn't already incentive to have someone read something that you've done, having it read something you've done that if, even if they don't like it, to, ex to ha hopefully have it experience some of the, the, the Asian American history in this country that we don't talk about, uh, you know, put an extra uh, light under my fire, uh, put an extra fire under my butt. I think that's fascinating. I, I had no idea. That's why I love doing historical research and finding out stuff that I, c I can't believe it, uh, it happened. I'm just curious, wh what is the, uh, um, what, what mystery is he solving? Well, it, kind of in classic noir sort of fashion, he is in search for a missing woman. And then in looking for this missing woman, he finds she she may or may not have ties to a string of murders that are happening in in Chinatown, and uh, yeah, and that's all I'll say. That's all I'll say for now. Okay, is it a miniseries or is it ongoing or what? It is. It is a miniseries. It's nine issues with the idea that if people like it, and because I'm too superstitious to uh, assume that 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 they will, but if people like it, there's room for sequels. That is pretty cool. All right, I'm I'm definitely interested now. I I read the Maltese Falcon, so I'm uh I'm I'm very interested. In...
Uh, cool. Uh, and so now you're, and so you're, you're, you're just your freelance life. That's pretty much you're, you're doing this and it's its own thing. We could, oh boy, we could talk about like pitching to image and setting up a budget and hiring artists. That's this whole thing that, uh, that I would love to learn about. Uh, or, or... If it helps at all. And again, this kind of comes as like shelling from my own, shelling my own stuff. But, um, but it's the reason why we did it is to sort of make it helpful. In the infotographic novel, we include at the end, our 16 page pitch to image and it's how and it's basically our cold pitch to image like you know we sent it in and eventually we we sort of got a response and so for us pitching was just as easy as putting together just as easy and just as hard as putting together that 16 page pitch and putting it out so so uh, and we could get into that if you want here but also too for anyone who's interested like in the in and you can buy a copy you can get it from your library however you however you like um, that that's what we did. And so you can see exactly what we did and exactly how we pitched the image. In, if, if you have a copy of the trade. Well, if people are interested in seeing it, uh, it's on comiXology unlimited right now. Uh, and people can go, can go read it that way. That's how, that's how I read it. I, um, yeah, I, I, I what you're saying about the pitch in the back, it definitely is. I think I did see something back there. So I, I, I will take a look. Uh, other writers have talked about like the money they've put into their project and how much project, you know, which, just uh, the, the folks at home, like if they want to do an image pitch, you know, how much money should they be setting aside for? I, I'm just going to throw it in. You know, what, 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 what is reasonable? I mean, it's, it's hard to say because it is, um, it, de it depends on your creators. You know, I, I know, you know, I'm a, I'm a creator that believes very strongly about paying your artists. I've heard other creators, I've heard other artists say, don't pay your artists. You know, you want them to have, you want them to feel something personal. You don't want to think they're, you know, just punching in a paycheck. There's a range of different answers to it. Um, you know, I, my book was, my book was because it dealt with very potentially controversial, potentially inflammatory. You know, it's a book about race. And so if I screwed up, it would have blown up in my face badly. So as a result, I, you know, my entire creative team between us, we have about half a century's worth of experience working in comics. That doesn't come cheap. And so like, I know I paid Aaron better than he was making at Dynamite and he was making the top rated Dynamite. You know, so, but that's not how everyone needs to make a comic or everyone sort of should make a comic. So it's hard to say, you know, how much money people should set aside because it really depends on, 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 on the artist. I, it's more just, what do you need to get the job? What do you need to tell your story? You know, like for me, it was, you know, I needed, I needed Aaron, you know, I needed, before I knew who Aaron was, I knew what I needed. I needed an artist who was, who could do people of different ethnicities. So his art had to be somewhat realistic, somewhat photorealistic, but not so photorealistic, it was stiff. It needed to be expressive enough because it, need, it could handle horror. He needed to be a professional. Um, so someone with a track record for turning in pages on time because they didn't want to wait three years for the, you know, to, for the book to come out because my artist was taking forever, which means that he had to be, be working for a while and which means he had to be vetted but it also means that he couldn't work, be working for Marvel and DC because I couldn't afford to pay their rates. So those were my, and like, and when I look back and I think like, I can't believe any artists existed that hit that criteria. And so when I found Aaron, he's like, he does all the things I'm looking like, yes, you know, and you know, I'll figure out a way to pay him, you know, what, what he's worth. Um, similarly, Jose, you know, was a friend and, and Jose's colored all the big artists, you know? And so, um, and, and so, but I, and he gave me a, a you know, he kind of gave me as, as many artists in comics, yeah, they, there's the, the friend rate. He gave me the friend rates or coloring, but he was also the editor. And so he had a lot of like personal, you know, uh, uh, a lot of personal stuff at stake. And Jeff Powell has, you know, he's done so, so, so much in comics, but that's the thing that's kind of the great thing about comics is that there's no one way to kind of work, you know? Um, but I think it starts with you stopping and sort of saying, you know, what does this book really need? You know, um, in terms of the art style, in terms of the art, and then taking a look at sort of saying, all right, you know, if you're doing a superhero book and you're looking for like that kind of big bombastic superhero art, that's probably gonna get pretty expensive. 
because people working on those books are working at Marvel and DC. You know, uh, where I was looking, I was working on a horror book. That was a little bit easier because there's not a lot of horror books coming out, and most of them aren't coming out from people. And it's that's changing a little bit now, but like the places where you could find a horror book uh, are not places that are paying like the huge bucks. And so that made it a little easier for me. So you've got to kind of take into all of that sort of account. So there's no kind of like no sort of one size fits all, um, you know, in terms of like how much you should set aside. It's really what kind of art are you looking for? And, you know, and then talking to those artists and sort of seeing like seeing how much they charge. And listen, newer people are going to be cheaper, but newer people also don't have a track record of turning things in on time. And that's just a, a, a calculation that you, that's a risk that you have to take. And so and to me, that's the thing is like, and I found this when I was working at indie film, there's a temptation of thinking like, oh, when you're making an indie film, you're just like, oh, I know this, I know someone who can do sound. I know someone who can, you know, who can shoot things and all that sort of stuff. And what you find out really quickly is you're not actually paying for their talent. You're paying for their commitment. You're paying for them to show up on time and, and do the things that they were going to say to you. When you work in indie film, you learn really quickly that, you know, even if you can pay someone $100, if you have a choice, or I found, if I had a choice between paying someone $0 and paying someone $100, I'll pay someone $100 because for a professional, that's a contract they've made in their head. I've accepted a job for $100, where if you're not paying them anything, they're like, I'm doing you him a favor. And I can, you know, it's Saturday and I've got a stomach ache and, you know, I'm not in the mood to get, do my friend a favor today, maybe next week. But if you pay him a hundred dollars, like, well, I made, I made, you know, that was a contract I made. So I, even if I have a stomach ache, I got to work because that was my contract. So, so I think it all depends on just, it just depends on your project. So I'm curious. All right. So, um, let you, you're uh, a writer, you've, you know, paid, uh, the most you can afford to get somebody a comic book. Uh, you're ready to email it or, or, or ship it in, um, to the offices. Uh, and now, and, and what do you say? Cause you know, what, I don't know, what what you know what, uh, what do you say to the editor to uh to get a job i mean like i know that right now um the, you know it, it, you're not going to they're not going to say oh yeah ongoing spider-man for you buddy you know they're not going to say that what do they you know what what can you expect and and what do you even say in that first email uh i think it's hard to say like, there's not honestly there's not that much that you can say in the first email all you can say is i hope you enjoy my work and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, there's a lot of different ways into comics. Honestly, I think the most tried and true is not the one that I did, but the most tried and true, because comics is a commitment, not just in terms of money, but also in time. And so finding out who your peers are in comics helps. So, so is to say that, okay, if you're there making a Kickstarter book, well, who else is making Kickstarter books out there around the same level that you are. If you're a Kickstarter creator that's going to conventions, well, who else is all that? Find your community and, and support each other. And what happens is when one person makes, if it's a strong community, when one person makes it, they'll help the others. And I'm not by saying like one person gets a job at Marvel, they'll get all their friends' jobs at Marvel. But what I am saying is that if one person works with an artist that is cheap and reliable, he's gonna be like, hey, hey guys, he doesn't have work and he's cheap and reliable. You should think about him for your book. And so that's how you hear about artists. And that's, how, and, or someone will be kind of like, hey, this website is doing all this press about my book. You know, you should look into it because they'll probably talk about your book as well. I do think finding those communities in comics so that you can rise together helps because it is a hard thing. Because the thing that no one tells you about being a comic book writer is that Yes, there's a lot of time alone. There's a lot of time like pouring into his stuff, but it's a team. It you unless you can draw, you have to learn how to be social and work as a team. And that means as a comic writer specifically, learning how to interact with artists and other writers and editors. So unfortunately, there is a social component to that job. You know, because you can't draw yourself. There will always be a social component to being a comic book writer because you cannot and, there are certain comic writers who don't have to because some of them come from other, some of them are novelists that have agents that are filmmakers, you know, screenwriters and they get successful in other places and then come here and then they can get jobs at Marvel and DC. But if you're coming in straightly through comics, then you have to know how to talk to other comic book creators, how to be friends, be real friends, be allies and friends with and promote their work and promote artists work. And, and 
see an artist that you think is amazing that's really hardworking and their success will not benefit you at all and still promote their work. You know, that's I feel like that is the most tried and true method. And then as you're doing that, what you'll find is, you know, maybe a friend of yours will know an editor or someone in that community will know an editor, but then word about your work will kind of will will start to reach editorial. And you know, and you'll pitch, you'll keep pitching sort of along the way. But the idea is you just want everyone in that community, that editorial community to be as familiar with you as possible so that by the time you give your first break, it is, it's not there. They feel like they're taking the least amount of risk. Okay. I, I can, uh, I can appreciate that. It sounds like a little bit of what you hinted at was, was sort of what I've heard. It, it seems like for, for artists, it's a visual medium it's a little bit easier it's a little bit easier to hey here's a cover do a cover for me yeah. do a thing for me yeah. for writers not so much like for writers you know their first gig you know that's going to be like you know what a a, 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 a one-off uh you know eight page story here and there i would imagine that's what that's it's some that first you got in because you're you were buddies with somebody and you got in that's probably what you can expect yeah yeah i a way of looking at it is don't think of yourself as a writer. Think of your, or don't think of yourself as just as a writer. Think of yourself as a writer producer. You're producing comics. You're producing opportunities for yourself. So that doesn't just mean reading, writing a script. That means also putting things together to get those opportunities to happen. You know, in a way, it's a lot like indie film, where you know, no director is just a director. They're a producer as well. I think that was a fantastic analogy. I think. Um... I think there are people, especially if you're watching, there, uh, there, there is it, the monolithic. Uh, it's a writer's job, or you have that one job that's for writers. You really, when it comes to even what you're doing, you're effectively like a movie producer. You're effectively the entrepreneur behind your project, who's not only written it, but you're also hiring all the people. You're investing all the money. You're getting it effectively distributed where you need it to go um you have to be able to think like an entrepreneur i'm thinking you know i'm wondering if that's that and that's why i try to talk about the business side uh, a little bit on on here because writing is also the business side of comics um so you know day-to-day -day life uh you know you're a writer on a book you're a, a com uh, an artist on a book uh and working with a you know what, what's that like and 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 working with a and what not to do with working with an editor you know I, I would imagine probably the first thing if i were to take a guess you know or actually no you say you know what what's the first thing you got to know when you work with an editor honestly the i try to figure out what i need to know as soon very early on in the process and then i try really hard not to bother them until my script is done. Like I try to be as, as uh, less, the least amount of maintenance as possible. Uh, you know, I know I talked to Kieran Gillen and Kieran Gillen has said that at the, be the beginning, what, you know, people liked, you know, when Kieran was just starting off at Marvel, it was just, oh, you give Kieran a problem and he can solve it and he doesn't, you don't need to spend a lot of time with him. He'll just go off and he'll come back with a solution or he'll come back with two and three solutions. Like that's what I try to be. And again, I've only worked on small short stories with, um, with Marvel and DC and, and all that. And with my, on my, the editors of my book, it's a little bit different because uh, I, I try to work with friends that I know and I trust. So it's a little hard to know what the professional relationship is and what's the like personal relationship of like, you know, like if you're a professional relationship with an editor, you shouldn't be sending them a link to this weird ass thing that you just saw. But when they're your friend, it's a little bit easier to do that. So, uh, so yeah, so, so, uh, so, so my experience with editors have been sort of more with short stories and it's just like, what do I need? Okay, let me go do it. Here's the script. You tell me if, if it works or not. So you're saying effectively like, don't be high maintenance. Yes, don't be high maintenance. That's very much so I know. So what does like high maintenance mean? Like for example, you know, does that mean if you're new and don't really understand a whole lot, like trying not to ask a gajillion questions? Because you said it at the beginning yourself, you know, try to get get what you need to know, and then yeah. just go off to the races. Like, what do you mean by that? Like, get what you need to know. If someone like if you get a shot to write a firestorm story, okay, 
I'll do all my research on Firestorm, but I need them to tell me, okay, who's Firestorm right now? Um, like, you know, who's Firestorm right now? If I know what story I want to tell, if it's about, I don't know, like, Firestorm's parents or Ronnie Raymond's parents, like, are they still alive? Are they dead? Like, where does the continuity sit in relation to my story? Um, you know, so that that is to me, like, I guess to me, it's once I'm pitched sort of a story and like kind of what they want. Oh, here's an example. Um, I was pitched a, I, they reached out to me to write uh, a Sergeant Rock story for Love is a Battleground number one. And so... And, and that's their Valentine's Day themed anthology. So they're like, we want a Sergeant Rock love story. Like, can like, are you interested? And so for that story, I was kind of like, I, I was like, I happened to be reading at the time um, a book by Alan Burby called um, Coming Out Under Fire, which is about uh, gay soldiers during World War II. And so I went to them and say, listen, if I did it, I would, at this moment, I would be interested in writing about sort of gay World War II soldiers. It, I wouldn't be turning Sergeant Rock gay, but probably he'll come across like some gay soldiers. And, and so, and the basic gist of the idea is the, pro the story will probably go like this. It'll probably be like, he comes across these soldiers. He thinks one of them is in love with one of the women in terms he finds out that he's in love with one of the men. And it's a way of talking about that. There were gay, there were gay soldiers that served in World War II. Um, are you interested in that? And they've run it up their flagpole. But then after that, it's kind of like the only questions I need to ask were, okay, um, sometimes it's, if these are characters I wanna use, what are your favorite story? You know, what is the stuff I need to read? Uh, what is, you know, at the time, they had thrown in this idea of, of well, if it's a love story with Sergeant Rock, like maybe it's involving this character. So then I'm like, great, can you tell me what stories are canon, are the important stories for those characters? You know, um, and so it's little stuff like that. It's uh, what does the costume look like now? You know, uh, but a lot of it is once I know what the story is in my head, knowing enough about the continuity, because it's not your job as a writer, in my opinion, different editors, actually, no, different editors feel differently about this. Certain editors like writers who know their continuity. I have a passing amount of certain continuity. Um, and so I'll be kind of like, this is what I know of the character. These are the beats that really affect my story. Is this still current in the continuity? Because I blinked and maybe you changed all that. Um, so yeah, so those, both, but, but I try to settle that out really quick and like, okay, great. I'm, I'll go write it off and I'll give you a finished script. I, I think you touched on a good concept. That would be my concern if, if, you know, let's say, hey, Angelo, go write an eight-page comic book story about Spider-Man. I, I, and, and I feel like they're change, their, their stuff is changing so rapidly with new concepts being thrown at you. Like, how do you, it, it, I mean, how do you deal with that? It, it, and I'm guessing it's just, you're just, that, that's what you're depending on your editor for. Just, hey, what do I need to know right now? Help me fit it in, in, in help yeah. me fit it. I knew I, they asked me to write a Dr. Strange, a 10 page Dr. Dr. Strange story. And I came back and saying, listen, I wanna write like a 10 page, I wanna do a horror story about Wong, his assistant. And they're like, yeah, we're down with that too. And then I was like, great. Um, can you give me all the comics that Wong has appeared in lately, just so I know where that character is. You know, and they sent me all that sort of stuff. But that's all stuff that you can kind of do like really early on and then you can just kind of move move forward from there. So he's like, oh, well now he's like a manager at a casino. I was like, oh, that's good to know. All right, so like, give me a, give me the comics that, you know, give, give me the comics where that, that led up to that. So, so, but yeah, but just knowing where your story kind of fits in with sort of the continuity. Ah, oh, that makes sense. So if I if I understood you correctly, you're actually uh, pitching s small stories or short stories while you're working for them, like almost like as a way to con like, um, almost like your next gig in a way. You you can say, in a way. See, I, I again, I have a weird sort of background because I write TV as well as comics. Um, I've been asked to do longer projects, but I unfortunately have to turn them down because like my schedule can get kind of crazy. So like. So, so for me, it's more like, like, again, 
I'm a weird thing. I was actually offered a four issue miniseries. I think it was four, maybe five issue miniseries with a character. And, uh, and I, I didn't actually turn that down. I gave him a very half-assed pitch, but because I kind of told them like, I don't, I really, I love to do this. I really don't have the time. Here's an idea I had, if you're interested in it, maybe we can find it. And they weren't interested in the idea, probably because I didn't have the time to like really like delve deeply into it, but they still wanted to do something. So they say, it's like, how about this 10 page story? And I'm like, I don't know if I have the time. And they were like, it's a 10 page story. Everyone has a time to write a 10 page story. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do it. That's actually it for editors. Listen, that's a great way to get writers to commit because I don't actually know if that's true, but I was like, does everyone have the time to write a 10 page story? Am I a bad writer? Cause I can't, I don't have the time to write a 10 page story. I guess I should write this 10 page story. Um, oh and that's how that, that Dr. Strange story happened. Um, uh, but yeah, but yeah, but it, but it is very much, uh, I, it would be nice if these smaller things led to sort of bigger things, but um, it, it, it's not a hundred percent my my particular strategy because because a lot of times these job opportunities will land in like bad scheduling moments. What what I've learned is that it, it, the bigger opportunities always land in bad scheduling moments. So like I just have to be kind of philosophical about that and just be like I'll, I'll take it as it comes. Wow, it's almost like that. Uh, uh... I don't know how to say it, but the the better you get now, all those things you want, all those opportunities you wanted before are coming at you now. You don't have time for them, so yeah, it's sort of like a it's a catch twenty two in a way. So, so were, do you pitch like for a short story writer? Do you pitch your short stories, uh, or or I think I I interviewed a, a DC Comics writer a couple of weeks ago, and he told me, um, I forget if he said they basically said, hey, we have you know we're doing detective comics, we have you know space for four issues or something uh can you fill this in you know pitch us a story um or i don't know if they had like an idea they gave him like a kernel of an idea and then you run with it and it has to fit into four issues is it sort of like that sort of relationship or um is it was yeah. is it different for what your experience yeah so like i said for short stories um most of the times the editors will come to you and so and if they come to you it'll be like i had i want something with this particular character and and sometimes it's with this particular theme you know, um, and, or like, you know, look, again, Sergeant Rock, Valentine's Day issue. So it should be a Sergeant Rock love story. Those two things, can you do anything with it? And that's usually how it sort of goes. I think there, I'm sure there are moments where, actually I've, I've been asked, like, if you want to do a X, you know, a story about this character, a story with that character, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 with my Marvel thing, it was, do you want to do a story with Doctor Strange? And then it's, and, and that one, I was given sort of no parameters and I sort of figured out what I wanted to do in that. So sometimes they give you parameters, sometimes they don't. It really depends. Okay. So when it comes to pitching, because that's where I guess some people might be confused. You know, oh, you pitched, you know, an X, uh, a X or Y story to to an editor. Um, and yet the website says, don't, uh, <laughs> don't, submit a, yeah, yeah. So, don't submit a pitch. What do you mean that's by that? Good, that's a good point. Uh, there's two types of pitches. There are pitches to get work and there are pitches once work is being offered to you. So for the short stories, it's always them reaching out and offering work. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't pitch to Marvel and DC in terms of like, a, I don't try to get a job at Marvel and DC uh, personally. I want to be working on my own comics. That's like my energy is to work on my own comics. Um, and I'm lucky enough at this stage of my career that when it comes to doing non-image books, publishers are saying, please, pitch us an idea because we want to publish a book written by you. So th those pitches are, are, are by invitation. Um, so yeah, so, th so there are, there's a difference between pitching by invitation and cold call, cold call pitching. And cold call pitching, I think is what we were talking about in the beginning, which is, you know, just make your own comic and sort of do that. It is very hard to, to cold call pitch a short story, primarily because editors are looking for very specific sp spots to fill. You know, they'll, they'll be like, oh, like again, there was an anthology in it and they wanted a Sergeant Rock story in a Valentine's Day anthology. That was a very specific hole that the editor had to fill. So, um, and that, that's honestly most of the times how it, how it is, you know, when, when they, you know, they ha probably have an anthology, like here are my big names for the anthology. And then we've got these little spots left over and then they're like, all right, who can fill those spots? So, it's better to pitch sort of bigger projects. In a, if it's a cold call pitching, pitch your mini series, pitch your ongoing book that will probably get turned into a mini series. But, um, but short stories, you can't really, those are invite only, generally. Okay, thank you for, um, 
so you're saying even with a cold pitch, you could pitch a, or you could pitch a a, a mini series for you know whatever character or no? If you're if you already have a warm relationship, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If 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 you were good, I mean, honest. The the truth of the matter is is that I think, and I I could be wrong. At this point, I think all work at Marvel and DC is kind of invite only. Like, I don't know if they're taking many outside pitches. I'm tempted to say, actually, a lot of the companies won't because for legal reasons. Because if they read a pitch and then it turns out something, then they're liable. So, so even the term pitching doesn't totally work in Marvel and DC. At Marvel and DC, when I start to say pitching, it's you're you're invited to pitch, and this is what you should do when you're invited. This is what I do when I'm invited to pitch. Cold call pitching, I feel like nowadays is more for the other companies, and that's original material. Gotcha. So, it, generally speaking, more opportunities are afforded to you once your once your foot is in the door. Once you already have an open relationship, they'll call you. Hey, can you give us an you know idea for a five ish you know for a five uh, for a five page story? Versus, and then you might and then they you, they might say, hey, do you have any Spider Man ideas? We're open to a a longer form pitch. Yes. And that's how that works. Okay, thank you for clarifying that because I'm sure a lot of people that's that's probably um, confusing for. So um, I guess my uh, one of my questions for back to um, you know what not to do, and this is the cl- this is the thing, right? Writers complaining, my editor's trying to change my story. This person he just wants to be a writer. He he's he's some hack writer and he's just trying to. So I, I'm I'm assuming you're gonna say be coachable. Or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think. Listen, there are definitely editors who are like. There are definitely editors who are like that, right? Um, I think as much as possible. And again, this is weird because, like, this is one of the ones where this is not territory that I that I work in and that, that I do. So it's a little bit from the outside looking in. Um, know who you're working with. Know what their reputation is. You know. Um, some editors are frustrated writers and that's how they will get, that's how they get their notes. And, and sometimes you're just like, yeah, that's, you know, that's what it is. And, and some editors will change what you write and, and put it up there and it's under your name. And hopefully you don't work with those editors again. So that, is, you know, that's it, it, a lot of it is knowing um, it's just knowing what you're getting into. And, and I, again, it, to me, it goes back to, you know, you're not a writer, you're a producer. And so as a result, it's not about, I get an assignment and I turn in the assignment. That's part of the job, but that isn't the job. The job is finding a community that you'll protect each other that you'll, that where you'll go like, oh, you don't want to, I know you think you want to work with that editor, but you don't want to work with that editor. And here's why, or this is a company that normally would be a good place to work for, but right now they're going through some things and they, and they don't like it, you know, that's again, that's how you get around sort of that's that stuff. And in terms of if you're in a position where the editor, um, you know, is overriding your stuff. I also feel like too, that's where being a part of a community helps because you can ask your friends who are kind of like, Hey, um, <clears throat> if I tell this guy to, you know, screw off, is that going to be a problem? And they'll be like, yeah, actually it is. Or it's like, ah, don't worry about it. Or don't worry about it. I'll get you a job over here and all that kind of stuff. But again, but like, you know, there used to be a time where that used to be hard to do to find a community because you couldn't travel to conventions, but with everything happening online, like it's, it's easy. It's easier now, you know, and it can start by finding people who are your peers and promoting their work and, you know, asking them advice. I mean, be careful with that. Like, so actually the people who don't, who aren't interested will not reply to you. And then the thing not to do is don't badger them. Um, but, you know, I think that it, it's, <sighs> there is how to make a comic and how to be a comic book creator. And being a comic book creator means being in it, in it for the long haul. And that means, you know, these people are going to be, whether you interact with them or not, they're going to be your community and you might as well interact with them because, because they are. Okay. That, that makes sense. So that, that's the, uh, the unhealthy version. The healthy version would be, you know, you got some notes and they're very minor. Don't blow up. 
You know, how, how do you take that credit, you know, criticism? I, guess. I think, I think, I or think no. every time I get a note, every time I get a note, uh, I'm just like, ah, they're wrong. So you wait 24 hours and then you sleep on it and you're just like, oh, I sort of see the point. I think what helps is believing. I think what helps it, to start, every, everyone's innocent until they're proven guilty. So don't go in thinking an editor is just a frustrated writer. Go in thinking an editor is uh, is someone whose job it is to try to for you to do the best version, to be the best version of yourself. And then you will see by their decisions whether or not they are not that person, whether or not they are going to fail at that and um, and are just sort of frustrated writers. Those people will out themselves very quickly. But start assuming that it really is them trying to make you for your better, you know, the best part of yourself. And then, uh, and then once you do that, then say like, okay, does this actually make it better? Um, you know, I think there is a, a writing professor said to me once, it's like the, the tricky thing with notes is that when someone gives you a note, all they're really telling you is what they would do if they would write your story. And that's true. Um, but if everybody would do the same thing, if they were write your story, there probably might be something you should listen to. And good notes are those notes where everyone might do, might say the same thing, whether they know it or not. And that's to me how you, you look at notes. So, that, so for um, somebody watching this who doesn't know what like notes, what, what, what would be an example of a, a, a good note? A, a good note is a, a change that makes that makes a story better. That's all I mean when I say good note. Just a, a change that will make the story better. Sure, uh, there are uh, <clears throat> a bad note is it's easier to say what sort of what a bad note is than a good note. And a bad note can be something that sets the story back. It's like oh we need a fight scene over here where it's got nothing to do with the story, uh, or it's a note where you know. They just want a change for change sake. I know an editor who would always want a change in every page because they need to know there was a little piece of them in every page of the comic. You know, those are bad notes. And then it's a matter of like, can I isolate those bad notes from the, you know, if I give the editor a place for them to have, does it really hurt my story? Because at the end of the day, that's what you want to protect. You want to protect the story. It, in a weird way, you want to protect the story over your vision. Sometimes those overlap, but they don't always overlap. Okay. So, you know, uh, thank you for explaining that. So a good note would be something, could be something simple like, you know, uh, break this panel into two or something or something simple like that. Okay. Um, I can appreciate that. Uh, I'm curious, uh, how to make your editor happy. What, so I'm working for you. How do I make you happy? How do I make you want to hire Angelo again or whatever? Lots of compliments. Um, you look great today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but, but also, you know, um, yeah, things, there's the three things that, uh, there's a three, th what is it? It's, there's a three things that everyone wants out of a freelancer. You're looking for someone to have all three, but you'll settle for two out of three. So you want them to be fast slash on time. Uh, you want the work to be quality and you want them to be uh, uh, a pleasure to work with. Uh, you will deal, you, you're always looking for someone to be three out of three. You can handle if they're two out of three, but if they're only one out of three, they'll probably won't get another job. So you'll give someone at work, if they're a great person to hang out with and a good writer, but they're always late, you'll still give that person work. You'll give person work who's maybe not that great, but always pops up on time and it's a pleasure to work with, you, you give that person work. You'll give person work if the work is good and they're always on time, but they're an absolute asshole. You'll give that person work. But if they're only one of those three, then they won't, then you won't. But the thing that you want to be is three out of three. You want to be the person that's fast and on time. The work is always good and you're a pleasure to work with and everyone's going to want to work with you. Hey, I know you got to get out of here. Thank you so much for your time. Um, last thing, just uh, give a plug for your, for your, uh, for your comic book. When does your comic book come out? Book comes out May 5th, uh, The Good Asian from Image, although in this pandemic age, pre-orders are the whole game. So uh, our FOC is uh, April 14th. So let your, let your stores know that you're interested and if, you, if, you're, if you're interested. 
That sounds, and I encourage everybody watching this to go do that. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to checking out your comic book. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I had fun. Thanks for this. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. You too, man. Okay. Bye. Ciao. And there you have it. I hope you learned a lot about how to break into the comic book industry as a writer. Thank you again to Pornsack Pishachuk for taking the time to do this interview. If you viewers would like to learn more about his new image comic miniseries, The Good Asian, then check out the link in the description below. If you found this video helpful and you'd like me to keep making more, then please convey that to both me and the YouTube algorithm by hitting like, subscribe, and the bell icon for notifications. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future videos, then please let me know in the comment section down below. I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.